All right, I shared my screen. And I will start with uh, some review actually of uh, the last two lectures. So um, nine by nine. I, and I don't know how can I stress enough for you guys that if you have any question, whether you have studied or not, you should stop me and ask. As you recall, the linearization and symmetry of the airplane decoupled the equations of motion into two sets, four by four longitudinal, governing the longitudinal flight dynamics along the XZ plane, anything in that plane. So this is the X body, this is Z body, so out of the nine motion variables, we have four. You can use this. So this is uh, U, forward speed of the airplane. W, which is measure of the angle of attack, right? Theta, this is actually theta, the angle, and the angular velocity Q. So U, W, Q, theta. Any motion, any symmetric motion along that plane, any motion where the, wing, the right wing experiences the exact same condition like the left wing. Okay, so we have four state variables, u, w, q, and theta, and uh, via, when we did, so this is after linearization. So we have a linear system with uh, four states, u, w, q, and theta. So this is the S domain, real and imaginary. So we get uh, four eigenvalues. Right, and this is typical for uh, typical for any airplane. So some some something like here. This is a complex conjugate close to the imaginary axis with a small frequency, so slow speed and slow and the low damping. Right, and another pair quite far from the measuring axis relatively. And uh, good damping. So this is what we call what? Anybody remembers what mode is that? The short period. Very good. This is the short period mode. And anybody remembers? Anybody remembers? Uh, uh, what so um, among the four variables, what are the most two variables that are mostly affected by the short period mode? Yeah, the W and alpha, and then Q. Exactly, W or alpha, because they are the same thing. Simply, W is some constant multiple of alpha, right? So you can either include W or alpha and the pitch rate Q. So uh, whenever your airplane experiences a disturbance in that plane of symmetry. Whenever it experiences a disturbance, whether this disturbance is from the surrounding air or from the pilot, what will happen is that over the very first couple of seconds, the angle of attack and the pitch rate will change the most at almost constant speed. So U is almost constant, delta U is almost zero, right? So in fact, this is the mode, this is, this is the mode that has to do with the pitching dynamics. Pitching dynamics of the airplane. By this, I mean it is the mode whose natural frequency is about, uh, this is the mode whose stiffness is all about the pitching. Guys, uh, when I write M alpha, and I tell you, I tell you, alpha is an angle of attack in the pitching direction, of course. M is a pitching moment. And I ask you, this term is a stiffness or damping? Uh, I, I don't want this to, um, you should not let this pass. Okay, this is one of the essential things that you should come out of this course. And this is actually unique to this place. So it's not being taught in everywhere in flight mechanics. We, I stress it so much. I will definitely ask you about it in the final. And you may really encounter some of these things in your interviews at companies. 
when you know that alpha is a pitching angle or angle of attack in the pitching direction, M is pitching moment, and I ask you, is this stiffness or damping? It'll be a stiffness, right? Yes, this stiffness, and I'm asking the entire class, is, is anyone doesn't understand why this is stiffness, why this is a spring action? Please don't let it pass, and please do never feel shy. That's fine. Um, Professor, could you explain it by any chance? Yeah, uh, so uh, the point simply is it all goes to the mass spring system. So this is a mass. This is K. The equation of motion is simply mx double dot. If this is x, right? Equals the force coming from the spring, and the force coming from the spring is negative K times x, correct? Please, folks, pay attention here. This is important, and this is general. So this is the main point, uh, and uh, there are three things here to be emphasized. The negative, which means that the force of the spring is always restoring, always opposing your displacement. K, there is a proportionality constant to X to the displacement. So the larger the displacement, the larger the force. So this is the spring. So whenever you have a mechanism, any mechanism that gives you force, restoring, proportional to the disturbance, it's a spring action. And it can be translational like this. It can be rotational. I can exactly do the rotational analog of it. And this is the mass I. So the equation is I theta double dot is negative K theta. Again, it's the same three, um, three uh, concepts or the same three characteristics. The negative, which means restoring proportional to the displacement. So whenever you see what is what should go in the right hand side here in this equation, this is I theta double dot equals the torque, the moment. So whenever you see a moment that is negative, restoring, opposing to displacement and proportional to the displacement, this is a spring action. So when you look here, M alpha, alpha is a, an angle of attack in the pitching direction. M is the moment due to alpha. And we know that it's opposing because it's negative, M alpha is negative. So immediately I, 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 I realize that this is a moment due to an angle or a force due to a displacement. This is a spring action, okay? So in, in, in other, in, in, uh, can you tell me what is, what is the spring for the, um, the other direction about Z, for example? What is the moment about Z? What is its symbol? That's the moment about Z. N beta? Exactly. So this is, again, a moment due to angle. This is a stiffness in the other direction, right? And L beta is roll stiffness, right? So this is about stiffness and about damping. If we have a damper here, then we have another term, another force, which is negative Cx dot. Again, it's negative. It's, rest it's opposing, restoring force. And see, there is a proportionality constant it's proportional to not the displacement, but the velocity. So uh, if you have a larger, if you move, let's say 10 centimeters to the right, it doesn't matter. It matters the speed by which you're moving. So the damper opposes the speed. Okay, it's proportional to the speed. The same here, negative C theta dot, right? So whenever you have a force, an opposing force, proportional to velocity or a moment, a torque, proportional to angular velocity. This is damping, okay? This is very important. There are gonna be several questions in the final with this language. Pitch stiffness, pitch damping, yaw stiffness, yaw damping, roll stiffness, roll damping. And they all come with that table. They all come with that table, if you remember. We have L, M, N, and the angular velocities are PQR. So simply L, P is roll damping. M, Q is pitch damping. N, R is yaw damping, because each one of these is a moment due to angular velocity, right? Like exactly this term. And they are all negative, of course, okay? For the corresponding angles, we know the corresponding angles. Here is alpha. And because we're not considering the Euler angles here, we're considering the aerodynamic angles. It's just two angles, alpha and beta. 
So beta here and beta there. So L beta is roll stiffness. M alpha is pitch stiffness. N beta is yaw stiffness. Is this clear enough? Any question about this? Um, so professor, I remember like, um, like maybe like lecture 10 or something. I, I remember we derived this equation for, uh, for M alpha. Like we did this, we did the differential equation that you've written in the bottom. But if we wanted to do it for um, like in the Z direction for, for yaw, for example, would it be the same exact process? Yeah, yes, but we will not, we, we don't need to do it because we already in that lecture, this was, I don't know, lecture maybe, uh, I don't remember which lecture is that, but anyway, we, we after, after that we derived, we have access for, to the full equations of motion. When we did it for the pitching, we have only one degree of freedom in the wind tunnel. And we derived an equation for this, for the one degree of freedom for the wind tunnel. But now we have these several degrees of freedom. So we have coupled equations of motion. They appear in the nine by nine. Okay, so they will not look that simple to identify which stiffness and which is damping. But I can identify them from here, from just the basic definition. Okay. Thank you. So again, for this mode, this is really what the airplane gonna experience over the very first couple of seconds. And it happens at almost constant speed, which means that really in the wind tunnel, if you are in the wind tunnel, this is the mode that you're gonna observe because the wind tunnel, I mean, we have a constant speed, right? So if you have a sensor, put it in your airplane in the wind tunnel, this is the mode that you're gonna observe. This is exactly like, uh, problem one in, in, in homework seven, right? We have in the wind tunnel, we did an experiment, we measured the time response of the pitching angle, and we need to identify from the settling time and overshoot, we need to identify the stiffness and damping. What are the stiffness? Well, like I said, this mode is really mainly associated with the pitching dynamics. So your stiffness is the pitching stiffness, M alpha. So really M alpha is the thing that sets your natural frequency. Because remember, the natural frequency is set by your spring, square root K over M, right? And uh, what is your damping here? Can you tell me what is what is what should go here to the damping? Any suggestion? Uh, should be M cube. Yes, exactly. So this is, again, we're talking about the pitching dynamics. Here is the pitching dynamics. M alpha is the pitch stiffness, M cube is the pitch damping. So this indeed will go and determine your zeta. And in fact, we derived the expression two lectures ago for omega n of the short period mode in terms of m alpha and for zeta of the short period modes in terms of m q. Any question about that? Any question about the short period mode? Any question? And indeed the short period mode, yeah. Professor, just just to clarify on the the plot that's sort of a root locus plot that you've just drawn. Just uh, I'm 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 trying to remember the the distance from the real axis uh, has to do with the the frequency and the distance from I guess in this case the the x is what again. The distance from uh, okay, so there are two. In general, this is what we call omega damp. The imaginary part is what we call the damped frequency. Okay. The the real part is is the reciprocal of the time constant. So uh, this is zeta omega n. This is the real okay. part. Multiplication of zeta omega n and the four divided by that gives you the settling time. Gotcha. And, okay. Uh, Thank you. The, the 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 diagonal is the omega n the natural frequency. Right. So okay. Usually, right. usually go with the diagonal and zeta omega n to get both omega n and zeta. Mm -hmm. All right. The what? Wh what do we mean here by the pitching dynamics? Again, we discussed this before, but let's discuss it again because we're reviewing what is happening with all these modes. What is happening with the pitching dynamics is the following: is that when when I have an airplane like this. And it's flying, say, horizontally at zero angle of attack. Assume this at the moment. So this is your U or V. And you apply a pitching moment. You push your elevator. You either take a disturbance or you push, um, uh, you, you, you pull your, your stick towards you. So you pull the airplane. You want to do a pull up, okay? What happens? 
Well, you apply the moment on the airplane. The airplane is not a point mass. It's a rigid body. It can rotate. So the airplane indeed will rotate and this will happen. And what do you think about the velocity vector? Will the velocity vector rotate with the airplane or not? Let me say this is V, the total velocity vector. Will the, the velocity vector rotate with the airplane or not at the beginning? Any suggestions? Uh, not until the angle of attack increase changes the lift. Exactly. So this is what's happening is that the airplane, I mean, you apply the moment on the body, the body will rotate, but the velocity vector is, is, is different. So now we have what? We have this angle of attack, alpha. And whenever you have angle of attack at the beginning, I had lift that is equal to the weight. But this increase in the angle of attack will give you delta lift, right? Extra force. And this extra force is simply perpendicular, is normal to the speed. So it will do what? It will make the speed pull up, right? It will deflect, will make you turn, your velocity vector turn, right? So eventually it will be aligned with the airplane uh, and the airplane will go up, that's fine. But these changes in the very first couple of seconds, these oscillations where the airplane rotates, but the velocity vector is not. The angle of attack increases, which increases the lift, and then the velocity vector rotates. And during this excursion, this is not the only story. There is another part of the story because whenever you have an increase in the angle of attack, the horizontal tail responds back by a restoring moment, right? So this all happens during the very first couple of seconds. And this is your pitching dynamics, which you can observe in the wind tunnel and which is adjusted by what part of the airplane? What part of the airplane that can adjust M alpha and M u for you? These are the horizontal tail. Exactly, this is the horizontal tail. Let me use another color here, because this goes up, okay. Let me use, say, this. So this whole thing, M alpha and M q, they are adjusted by the horizontal tail. And indeed, in the first half of the course, we derived expressions for M alpha in terms of the area of the horizontal tail. And the stability derivatives lecture, we derived the expression for M Q uh, uh, in terms of the area of the horizontal tail. This is a summary of the short period mode. Any question about that? The long period mode gives you what happens afterwards. So first of all, what are the variables? Well, if we start here with four variables, U, W, Q, theta, W and Q are mostly described here. It's natural to think that U and theta are mostly described there. That's right. And this is really the airplane as a point mass. So after some, after any disturbance, the airplane will do like this, go up or go down and up, right? As you go down, the speed increases, the lift increases at some point, there is, delta left that will turn, right? That will turn your velocity vector and you go up all the way, go up. So you're, you're, you're now uh, against going up the hill against your weight. So your speed decreases until you have delta left here pulling you down again. So this is an interchange between kinetic energy and potential energy, losing, losing altitude, but gaining speed and then the other way around, right? And uh, this is indeed, there is no pitching for the airplane uh, body. Here, it's all about the velocity vector itself, the turn. So this is why it suffices to have the airplane as a point mass. Actually, this mode happens at almost zero changes in the angle of attack, right? So there is no pitching dynamics for the body. So the very first couple of seconds, they're gonna be all the pitching dynamics happening uh, or adjusted by the horizontal tail. And then followed by a long, long time scale. And you can expect that this really happens over a long time scale. The whole airplane goes down and then goes up, goes down and goes up. So this takes a long period. And really the mode is called long period mode or hugoid mode, which is a Greek word supposed to mean to fly, but actually means to flee. So, uh, 
this is the long period mode. So wh why we're doing this decoupling? Because now if you don't like the airplane behavior over the very first couple of seconds, don't go and mess up with the entire nine by nine equations. You will not be able to identify which part of the airplane to play with. Here we already nailed it down. If you don't like the airplane behavior of the very first couple of seconds, it's the horizontal tail, go and adjust it. Okay, what about here? If I don't like the behavior over the long period, well, we really derived expression for omega n and it was square root two g over u naught. As you can see here, there is no way to, to play with this and it's it really reflects what is happening. Because what is happening here? That gravity pulls you down, right? And then, because of your speed, kinetic energy increases, you, you go up again. So it really depends on your gravity and the speed you were flying by, nothing more. And this, and ideally speaking, this can go forever, but it damps out after a while. So what makes it damp out? What do you think? Like if, when you look at this picture, it, can, it should go forever, right? But it damps out, why it damps out? What source can make it damp out? Drag. Exactly, drag. So uh, if I have zero drag, I, I'm going to have zero damping here. I will continue forever. But because I, I have drag, actually, we derive this expression. This is one over left to drag ratio. So the larger the drag, the larger the damping ratio. All right, so this is the long period mode. What will continue after the very first couple of seconds Okay, this is this will be the behavior. Any question about the moods in the longitudinal plane? This is a summary for lecture 14. For some reason, you guys don't don't uh, don't uh, uh, ask questions, and you will regret it. Why? Because you will graduate, you will have questions, but there's going to be no one to answer these questions. Now we're here to answer your questions. And uh, I myself struggle when I find myself really want to ask someone a question I don't find. Someone to help me to answer. Now you have, uh, you have a privilege, but you're not making use of it. And you will regret it. And I, by the way, I receive emails from time to time from students of this class, I mean, uh, not your particular group. Uh, they come after graduation by two years or something and they are the in, in the industry and they send me email saying, yeah, you know, we really struggle with what you're saying now. It's uh, when we have questions, we don't know where to go. So try to make use of what is available now. If you have a question, don't feel shy. We're, we're all here to learn. Five by five lateral flight dynamics. So it's not this picture anymore. It's the other pictures actually. Like this picture, for example. We have vertical tail here, wing and wing. So this is the ZB, this is YB. So actually this is um, the side slip velocity V, right? And uh, the roll rate P, the other picture. This is X, and this is the velocity vector large V, which means this is the little V component along the Y axis. This is the Y axis. And in addition, in this picture, we have the yaw rate R. So uh, these are the pictures we see in the lateral. Either we're doing yawing, yaw, R rate, roll p rate or side slip little v and you know it's it's either v or beta the same relation exactly between w and alpha we have it between v and beta so uh, this is five by five uh, we have five modes i'm sorry we have five poles eigenvalues so let's see what what were these So this is the airplane again for a for a conventional airplane. So uh, almost any of the airplanes you, you have seen, we always have one eigenvalue at exactly at the origin. And this is not indicating any critical instability or something. It's just saying that 
this is um, an ignorable coordinate. This was associated with a psi, the heading of the airplane. Of course, the heading of the airplane, there is no mechanism to correct the heading if it's disturbed. If the airplane gets, if the airplane gets any disturbance in the heading, instead of what the airplane say was moving in the north, now it's moving northeast. So it got some disturbance towards the east. The airplane will not feel anything, right? because it's the exact same forces, exact same lift, drag, pitching moment, yawing moment, rolling moment, every, all the forces and moments will not feel any change due to this change of the heading, right? It's just the airplane is heading in another direction and if the airplane is not feeling any change, it will not respond. So it's as if this coordinate is critically stable. I mean, we, we don't typically say critically stable. We say it's ignorable coordinate because the airplane dynamics does not depend on it. Can you tell me, can you uh, just try to think and speculate about other ignorable coordinates that the airplane may have? Some variables so that when they change, not necessarily of these nine variables, other variables. So out of these nine variables, it's only one ignorable, which is the heading. The other eight are not ignorable, of course. Okay, what other variables? So that when they change the airplane dynamics, forces will not feel anything. What do you think? Any suggestion? And obviously I'm asking about variables that are not here. It's not speeds, UVW. It's not angular speeds, BQR. It's not Euler angles, phi theta epsilon. So other than these, what variables so that when they change, the airplane forces will not change? Obviously, location, X, Y, Z. So if I included actually X, Y, Z, some flight, I mean, many flight simulators, I mean, actually almost all flight simulators, they include in the, in the, in the flight dynamics not nine by nine, they include 12 by 12. They include the three positions so that when we solve the, when we simulate, we don't only get UVW, PQR and phi theta epsilon, we also get XYZ, the airplane location, how it changes uh, with time, right? Which is uh, quite a legitimate request. But these, these position coordinates, they are re really ignorable, right? The coordinates in the sense that, uh, I mean, if the airplane is here, it has the exact same dynamics as if uh, it's there another, at another location, right? The, the location itself does not affect the dynamics at all, does not change the forces at all, right? If the airplane is flying over California, it will experience the exact same forces in the same conditions if it's flying over Virginia, right? If it's the same condition. So the location itself does not change anything. So if I started with a 12 by 12, I would have actually gotten here four, four pools at the origin, okay? Questions about that? Professor, I have a question in regards to that. So would it also not vary with change in the altitude? Because I would expect since the pressure would change depending on where you are in the altitude that it would affect the forces on the airplane. But why does it not in the XYZ case? If you if you account for the, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric changes with the altitude, they're going to be they're going to be change right so if you in your equations of motion in your model if you account for this right so the, we, in the forces we have one half rho v square right so rho is floating everywhere if you specify rho as a function of h the altitude like the atmospheric tables then yes h will not be an ignorable coordinate but if you leave rho as constant rho of the air density of the air then H will be an ignorable cause. So it really depends on your model. And for a, for a, for an ex, for an uh, comprehensive model, so for an actual flight simulator, yes, of course, they, they include this dependence. It's a very good question. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, so we spent quite a bit of time with this. It doesn't deserve, to, it's an ignorable. We should have ignored it. Okay, what are the rest for? So we started with five lateral variables. Epsi is one of them and it's ignorable. It, it, it's associated with one eigenvalue of the origin, fine. 
where are the other four? How many moles? Yes. One more thing on that. Uh, so the, you say we say that heading is ignorable uh, psi there, but what about changes in psi? That's that's a different story, correct? Delta delta psi that does have an effect on dynamics. Right? Mm, no, actually here uh, psi and de and its delta they, they don't have any effects. So um, psi is not the side slab angle, right? Psi is just the angle between so side slab angle is here between v and and the x of the body assume that they are aligned together okay they are aligned together and uh, if they are both together pointing in that direction or they are pointing in the east direction this is the heading okay so uh, this heading does not affect anything okay okay mm -hmm. So, uh, because it's it's simply saying, it's simply saying the airplane. So the heading is one of the things that 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 can be explained with a point mass. It simply says that if the airplane is moving in that direction, or that direction, or that direction in the horizontal plane. So, uh, and this is all v aligned with the axis. It doesn't matter. So the airplane as a point mass is going in what direction? If you change this direction, what 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 does change? Like what forces do you get in the body frame? There is actually nothing, no no change at all because you, you're flying at the same speed, same angle of attack, same side slip angle. These are the aerodynamic angles, right? Because you, what are your forces? Well, my forces are aerodynamic. So epsi is not aerodynamic. So any change in epsi will not lead to any change in uh, in aerodynamic forces. Okay, what about gravity? Well, uh, gravity is pointing straight downward. So any change in the horizontal will not get you any change in the in the gravity force, right? Along the but the body axis. So this is why epsi is really ignorable. It doesn't affect your dynamics at all. So uh, what about the other four, four eigenvalues? Anybody remembers how many modes did we have in the latter? There was three modes. Exactly, there was three modes. So one of them was very close to the imaginary axis. Sometimes for some airplanes, it actually crosses the imaginary axis and becomes unstable. But in either case, it's too slow meaning that if it's unstable, it's fine. This is what we call the spiral mode. In this mode, if it's unstable, the airplane will go into spiral, spiral divergence. So we'll keep uh, turning in a steeper and steeper circle, and of course, going down as it, at, as it, uh, as it turns. So it goes into a spiral down, something close to spin. Uh, and the, 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 the best approximation that approximates this mode, this is one eigenvalue, so I need just one equation to approximate it. It's, it's just R dot was something times R, right? This was the equation. And what we have here, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, NR L beta minus the other way around, N beta LR over L beta. This is your eigenvalue. All right, what's the other mode? The other mode was quite important for airplane flight mechanics. It's actually, it was uh, here, right? Relatively fast. And uh, it's damping is questionable. Sometimes it's well damped. Sometimes we need more damping for it. This mode is the Dutch roll mode where the airplane is really behaving like, it's as if the airplane is skating. The airplane is behaving as a tree leaf it's mainly side slip oscillations. It's an oscillatory mode, right? It's a complex conjugate. So mainly side slip oscillation. So it's beta and like we know it's V or beta, right? And on the top of that, there is yaw oscillations as well. And indeed there is roll oscillations, but we had to neglect it in the approximation because at the end of the day, there are two eigenvalues. I'm gonna decide uh, for two variables. So these are the two mostly affected variables side slip and yaw and we know on the top of that there is roll oscillations as well it, this mode really resembles the 
the short period mode in 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 many in many sense so for example um here this mode was really representing the pitching dynamics over there this mode really representing the yaw dynamics sometimes we call it directional dynamics uh if this mode is adjusted by the horizontal tail this mode is adjusted by the vertical tail if this in the sense that if this mode was representing the pitching dynamics which means that its stiffness and damping are determined by the pitching stiffness and pitching damping it's the same here so this mode is the yaw damping and is the yaw dynamics which means its stiffness is really the n beta so the end beta is the thing that sets your omega n of the natural mode because it's your spring. Can you tell me what is your damper here? What is your damper? Any anyone? Maybe uh, nr. Very good. So this is the thing that really sets your zeta of the natural mode. And indeed, last lecture we derived an expression for omega n natural in terms of end beta and for uh, zeta natural in terms of nr. And if you remember, this is in the beta that we derived in the first half of the course in terms of the horizontal, the vertical tail area. So indeed, this mode is the mode that is set by the vertical tail. So if, if you're flying an airplane and the airplane keeps oscillating in yaw and side, side slip in an annoying manner, please don't go and mess up with the entire nine by nine equations of motion it will be quite misleading. You need to focus here and it's really adjusted by the vertical tail. Okay, so this is the good thing about scrutinizing the airplane flight mechanics in this way. Uh, and this is an interesting point. It's, 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 it's quite similar to, to the, uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you put an airplane here in the wind tunnel and allow it to yaw freely, similar to this, when you put an airplane in the wind tunnel, allow it to pitch freely. This is the dynamics you're going to observe. Here, if you put an airplane in the wind tunnel, allow it to yaw freely. So you put it on a shaft, vertical shaft, for example, okay? And allow the airplane to yaw freely. This is the dynamics that you're going to observe in the wind tunnel, okay? Uh, let me tell you the following. We already, we just discussed this, that when you apply a pitching moment, the airplane will pitch up, but the velocity vector will not, creating an angle between the two. And by definition, this angle is really the angle of attack, which will create a force, L, right? The left force, this force will deflect the velocity vector. And eventually you will get what you wanted as a pilot or autopilot. What about here? So I have my airplane. And I apply a I apply a yaw moment N. So this is okay. You apply your yaw moment. So at the beginning, the airplane velocity vector was here. So what will happen? Well, what will happen is that the airplane will rotate, right? So this is my x-axis. But we know for sure the velocity vector does not rotate unless you apply, right? Unless you apply a, um, a force perpendicular to it towards the center of rotation, correct? So this is the picture now. Let me continue. Any question about that? Any question about that? All right, so if this is the case, what does this angle, what is this angle? What do we call it? Um, I had a quick question, Professor. Of course. Uh, just when we said the yawing or uh, directional dynamics, does that also apply to the spiral mode? Or no, that, that, that's... Well, they are they are related, but this is a very good question in the sense that this is a very good question. Thank you. So we, we really think spiral 
it has to do, look at this. This is R dot equal something times R. It's at least the approximation that we, we wrote seems to be pure yaw. So if this is pure yaw, and we're talking about here is the yaw dynamics adjusted by the vertical tail, why not just adjust the vertical tail to adjust this guy? So this is where the, the, the approximation becomes very useful. So the approximation tells you that your natural frequency and damping of the Dutch roll mode really coming from N beta and NR, which are directly related to vertical tail. Whereas here, yes, it's yaw dynamics, but it's different view of the yaw dynamics. It's really not your N beta or NR will not gonna help. As you can see here, here is N beta and here is NR. So if you adjust, increase the vertical tail, it will increase both almost by the same amount. So uh, you gain something here and subtract it there. So, um, so it will not be useful. V adjusting the vertical tail would not be helpful in adjusting the spiral mode, okay? Okay. It's, it's different because here there is, uh, there is also rolling going on. Right. We did not, we did not account for it in the in the state equation, but it shows up here in L R L beta, right? So there is also roll on the top of that. Right. Okay. Okay. So let's go back here to our story. I have my airplane flying fine, and I apply the pure yaw moment. So I I just hold my airplane and rotate it. Fine. The airplane will follow you, but the velocity vector will not, right? And now this angle is what? Beta. Very good. Beta. Unlike this scenario where, as a pilot or autopilot, I pull the stick to climb. Fine, the airplane at the beginning will uh, pitch up, but the velocity vector is not. But eventually, because of this increase in the angle of attack and this force, which is now a centripetal force, pulling my velocity vector towards the center. So eventually, the airplane and velocity vector will pitch up. Any question about this story? The situation is not the same here. Why? Because when you do that, okay, you're fine. You created a beta, but this beta will not create a force towards the center. I need a force in this direction, right? To deflect my velocity vector to the right. Actually, it's the other way around. Now, I have, a, I have this beta, right? I have this beta. So uh, this is... Um, I need to apply... A, I need to apply a rolling. I need to apply rolling so that when I apply my roll, I'm exaggerating, of course. So this is the forces from the wing, the lift force. Now the lift force from the wing, they have a horizontal component. So this is a horizontal component of the lift force from the wing. This horizontal component can serve here to give me the centripetal action that rotates the velocity vector. Okay? So I have to apply rolling. I have to apply aileron. It will, if you did not apply aileron, fine. It will, it will happen because of the coupling, but on a slower, on a slower scale. So uh, I just uh, mentioned rolling because the, actually the last mode here has to do with rolling. This is the fastest mode of the airplane and it's pure roll. It's just LP times P plus L aileron times aileron. And again, if you don't like the roll behavior of the airplane, don't go and mess up here or mess up there. Don't go and play with the vertical tail or something. It's, it's, it's really in LP. Okay. So uh, this distillation this this section of the airplane flight mechanics into these modes help us understand better understand flight physics so when you have this picture zoom out like this you you have almost everything any question about that okay fine so this is a good review what else we're gonna discuss now uh actually the need for feedback control this was just review we, we spent like 
more than half the lecture just reviewing the last two lectures because they are very important. Need, I'm sorry, what's that? Need for feedback control. What are the reasons? Actually, there is a, a common and very famous behavior. It's trade off between performance, good airplane, an efficient and economic airplane, and stability and control. How is that? So let me ask you, let, let us take some examples. Let me ask you, I want to enhance my pitching dynamics, same alpha and same with you. I want to increase them. How can I do that by the airplane geometry? How can I increase this? Uh, increase the vertical or, or the horizontal tail area. Very good. So I'm going to increase the horizontal tail area, S tail. And increasing the horizontal tail area will lead to what? Well, actually, the airplane weight will increase. So this is a bad thing. Drag will increase, right? Because it's more area. And if the drag increase, the fuel consumption, M dot fuel of the airplane will increase. Perhaps you need now a bigger engine. You're losing on almost every single aspect. And I mean, things trickle down for airplanes. So this is why we're always obsessed with weight because there is something called growth factor in the sense that if you um, added one kilogram weight to the airplane. So you need more wing area to support this one kilogram, which means you need, now you added extra drag because the lift doesn't come for free, it comes with a side effect of drag. And if you add drag, you need bigger engine, you know, it trickles down. So when you add one kilogram, it trickles down to the end to uh, something like seven kilograms. This is the growth factor. And it goes both ways. If you save one kilogram of the weight of the airplane, it trickles down to about seven kilograms saving in the entire weight. Okay. It's something called growth factor for any airplane. It's around six or seven. All right. So we never want to, <laughs> to add any more weight. So this is not a good solution. If I want to adjust my pitch stiffness and pitch damping, my pitching dynamics, yes, of course, I can always do it by adding more tail, but this is like the naive solution. I'm not naive, let's, me, let's say it's the straightforward solution. It's not a smart, it's not clever solution, okay? It's just straightforward. Okay, so uh, what else? Remember, uh, I told you this before, uh, that um, if, when when you have this is your airplane, and this is this these axes are. This is where your CG located, and uh, this is the drag trim, and this is the neutral point. The airplane, the variation of the trim drag is something like this it attains a minimum here. I mean, of course you like to minimize the drag, but now uh, it attains a minimum at a value for XCG. This is the variation of trim drag versus CG. It attains a minimum at XCG behind the neutral point. So the airplane is unstable. So now this is again a uh, trade off. Should, should I have a stable airplane? So I have my CG here, but high drag. Or should I have a minimum drag but unstable airplane or some somewhere in between? So this is again trade off between performance and stability. Another clear point we we really saw it last uh, two lectures ago about the zeta of the long period mode. It was one over square root one over lift to drag ratio. Clear contradiction between performance metric. This is the ultimate performance metric for airplanes. Lift to drag ratio. Airplane aerodynamicists always want to maximize, and we always want to increase the damping ratio. Here is the clear contradiction. Okay. And many other examples say, I mean, last time we really mentioned this for the spiral mode, although the spiral mode itself is not that important, but it has interesting flight mechanics. And uh, if you remember, uh, we, for stability, CNR, 
CL beta should should be greater than the other way around, CN beta CL R. This is um, for this numerator to be positive, so the eigenvalue be negative, so we are like this in the left half plane stable. So how can we achieve this via geometry? Well, indeed, CLR is we have no control over because it's simply CL over 6, 1 plus 3 lambda over 1 plus lambda. So it's it depends on CL, the operating condition of the airplane. I have no control over. CN beta and CNR both goes with the vertical tail. So this is why if you multiply, you know, the vertical tail increasing by 50%, You'll multiply here by 1.5 and here by 1.5. They will cancel each that each with each other. I'm trying to make to satisfy this inequality. I'm trying to increase the left hand side and decrease the right hand side. I'm trying to see what what parts of the airplane that can allow me to do that. Seeing that CLR, there is no part of the airplane that allows you to do that. See in beta, there is the vertical tail, but it will increase the left hand side as well. CL beta, there was right at least dihedral. But the issue is that if you remember, if you increase CL beta, this will make the touch roll mode uh, bad. It's maybe even unstable, but the touch roll mode. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't increase CL beta. Although I, I mean, there is a means to do that, right? The means is here, throw gamma. I can always increase the CL beta by increasing gamma. And indeed, we have homework problem on that. But if you do that, the natural mode will go unstable or will be uh, light, light, very lightly damped. And remember, if I'm going to name one mode out of, out of these, how many? We have three modes in the lateral and two modes in the longitudinal. If I want to name only one mode where pilots are obsessed with, to uh, you know, it's really annoying to pass passengers and pilots to uh, perform the mission adequately. It would be the Dutch roll mode. So it's the most important mode. So I shouldn't be missing up with it. So the only solution to satisfy this inequality is to increase CNR artificially. Because increasing CNR artificially will satisfy this equation and also add damping. Remember CNR or NR is the damping for the Dutch roll mode. So now uh, hopefully we can add. So this is the yaw damping, right? All right, that's enough said. The conclusion is we need, in many cases, we need feedback control to adjust the stability and control characteristics of the airplane without missing up the performance. I can adjust the airplane stability and control characteristics by, by changing the geometry adding more horizontal tail area, more vertical tail area, uh, more wing dihedra, but this may mess up the performance, okay? So how to adjust stability and control without messing up the performance? Well, do feedback control, do it artificially. And luckily we have a wonderful theory that we had in lecture 12, the modern control theory. really allows you to do that, right? It allows you to do what? To do the paradise, to do pool placement. I can hold, just snap, go, and, you know, hold all these poles, these eight poles, ignore this thing because it's really ignorable. All these eight poles, hold them and move them, place them in the way you like. You want to place all of them, the eight, at negative 100 S? Fine. There is a theoretical means that allow you to do that. We can do pole placement, okay? It's a very powerful theoretical tool, right? So, uh, but is it really what we mean, what, what, we, what we want? Is it really what we want? Do you really want to make, to take all these poles and make them, place them all, all the way to the negative at negative 100 so that 4 over 100 is your settling time 0.04 second you really want your airplane to to settle in 0.04 second would this be okay with pilots would this be okay with passengers so uh, it turns out of course as expected not 
So the question, since we have a powerful theory that can give you whatever you want, the magic question is actually, what do we want? Right? This is now the question. And, and indeed, we ask this question for any application. You're designing a control system for a submarine. What do you want? What are the, the, what are the good characteristics? The settling time and overshoot. It's not like I can make it all the way uh, super fast, super duper fast. This is not, this may not be the best thing to do, right? So what do we really want? And because the airplane is, a, is an important system, it's an expensive system, an important system, may jeopardize lives. So uh, this question should be answered rigorously. So in fact, the, this is the topic of today, right? What an introduction, like one hour. So this is the topic of today. This is actually, what do we want? It turns out to be a long, a, a whole research by itself. It's called flying qualities. This is the topic of flying qualities. An airplane sometimes it's called handling qualities. So uh, like I said, because it's super important in the 60s, the Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA, they both together, they flew hundreds of missions. They asked pilots to fly hundreds of missions, change the airplane characteristics each mission and ask the pilot to give a grade so that these grades will help us to know the effectiveness of, of this airplane. Uh, so that I take this into account when I design my flight control system. Because now we, we know what we want. What we want is actually what the pilot wants. And for a commercial airplane is what the passenger wants. The comfort, the passenger's comfort. When we, when we say flying qualities or handling qualities, it's really the ride quality of the, of the airplane. Or for a fighter airplane, it's the effectiveness of the airplane as a weapon delivery system, okay? So uh, how, this, how do you like this airplane when you fly it? Whether as a passenger or as a pilot? Fine, so this is good, but uh, to me as a, as a flight control designer, as a geek who don't want to get out of my comfort zone. For you, for, for us as control designers, what do you really need to know without bothering with too much detail? Like what, what if, 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 if the, um, what if I give you in a homework problem, you will take and uh, go and design your controller. What do you need to know? Any, any suggestion? Uh Omega N and Zeta. Exactly, Zeta and Omega N, or the pole's location, right? So actually, this is what they did. It was, I still, every time I say this, and I still admire the DOD and the FAA to do that. Well, you control designers, you guys are geeks, and uh, you may not understand the, you know, the instinct of the pilot or anything about the mission. We will give you your comfort zone. We will give you the required poles locations for each of these modes, really. So this is the flying qualities and handling qualities of the airplane. It's just five tables for each of these modes. Each table gives you what is satisfactory as poles location or zeta and omega n for each mode. Obviously, the pilots don't know anything about the locations of the poles. So what the DOD and the FE, what this program did in the 60s is that they give the pilot an airplane with uh, different Zeta and Omega N for the short period mode. And they fly it. And they come back and give a grade. And they just tabulate this grade versus this Zeta and Omega N. And they do it over and over again. And as you may expect, they did this for different classes of airplanes. Because, of course, if you, if you ride you know, a Mercedes or BMW or whatever, or even a Ferrari, your opinion would be different. I mean, and I ask you, is this car good? Does it, does it drive well? Well, your, your answer would be different if you're, if you're driving a van or a truck, right? It's not, it's not the same metric anymore. So it really has to do with the class of the airplane and what, are, what mission are you doing, what they call flight phase category. So let's go here and capture these things. Let's say this is lecture 16, yes. Um, 
so this is um let me let me give you first here the the classes any, any question so far any question so far so uh, just to give you the conclusion everything else above this black line this was actually review oopsies this was actually a review right anything he, below this line is the new thing so it says if we just started our lecture okay just to give you an idea and uh, all what we're saying is that okay we're gonna do feedback control and we have a powerful theory that do pole placement it just places the poles wherever you want so the quest the natural question is okay where do we want to place the poles at that's simple and it seems that there is a huge research has been done for airplanes to give you uh, the good locations for the poles that's it okay so let's see uh, but like i said this happened for every class so we have classes for airplane actually uh, class one so we have uh, we have four classes class one is a small airplane uh, light so it's like a trainer airplane uh what else there is class two so this is medium weight and these classes are in the lecture and they will be given in the final so you don't need to include them in your cheat sheet this is low to medium maneuverability like what like uh maybe light or medium cargo or a transport airplane or a tanker just medium thing class three is the heavy version of that this is the heavy version and class four is the fighter fighter or interceptor so class four is really talking about high maneuverability things. All right. Uh, so this, this, this is the classes and there is also the flight phase categories. We have three categories. We have uh, cat A. This is non-terminal. So by non-terminal, we mean we're not, we're not doing takeoff and landing. So it's away from the terminal. On terminal and military. So this is uh, if we're doing military thing, non-terminal and um, military. This is like what? This is like air-to-air -air combat. Weapon delivery and so and so. So of course here we need high maneuverability and high precision. Cat B is again non terminal, so we're not doing takeoff and landing, but it's civil now. So, any civil, uh, any civil flight phase like cruise, climb, descend, you know. And uh, obviously, here we don't need high maneuverability, it's gradual maneuverability. And also, it's it's less precision. Finally, CAT C. So, depending on really the combination of the class of the airplane and the flight phase category, we have desired values for the zeta omega n for all the modes. So, CAT C. It, this is terminal now. So, this is we're doing just takeoff and landing kind of thing. So, in takeoff and landing there is no much maneuverability it's a gradual maneuverability but we need high precision remember uh, landing there is the glide slope which is negative three so this is the flight path angle must be uh, quite accurate quite precise during landing at, at negative three degrees all right 
Professor, I have a question about this sort of thing. I'm curious, obviously we're able to use feedback control and I'm guessing that's where we're going now to correct things and then put stuff where we want it. But are there requirements for, you know, the airplane has to be able to do certain things without feedback or like, I guess, are there requirements for inherent stability without a controller? Very good question. Yes. In the, in the, to, for, for certification purposes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the airplane has to meet some static margin. I mean, also it depends on the airplane. Um, it depends on the airplane type, but if it's a civil and transport airplane, it, it has to meet certain uh, inherent stability requirements. Yes. Okay. So you can't just say we're going to make it work by using control systems that wouldn't work without power it has to be yeah uh, if it's a conventional airplane but if it's a, if it's a fighter airplane you, ha you have complete freedom and indeed most of them they are unstable and you, you just come back and, and and adjust by feedback control very interesting okay so okay for any combination of this here are the grades that the pilot gave it's the levels of flying qualities we have three levels level one this is the, the best so uh, when they give level one this is the best this is the, the, the airplane is clearly adequate to perform the mission with reasonable uh, pilot workload. This is the best, okay? Level two is, uh, it's adequate to perform the mission, but with increased pilot workload. And finally, uh, the bad thing, level three, this is inadequate to perform the mission or it's really too much for the pilot. It's high or limiting pilot workload. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes. Yep, Abdullah. What do you mean by pilot workload? Like what would be considered as high pilot workload? Like if he pulls Fo focusing, too hard? Focusing, yeah, focusing on the flight itself, not the mission. Like focusing to stabilize the airplane. So you say if you are in an air-to-air -air combat, you're not focusing on the mission itself, but you're focusing on just making the airplane flyable. You know, uh, you keep steering, 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 you know, and using your pedal to stabilize, using your stick to stabilize. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Any question about these three tables? Uh, again, you, you will be, uh, they will be given in the final. Any question about these three tables? So let's see now, uh, for each combination, we're going to have a table for the flying qualities of each mode. I'm, I'm still really like so much that they give it to us in our, our own language, our comfort zone. Um, this is Professor. I have a question. Yep. Could you explain CAT C again? When you say terminal, is that like taxiing around the airport or take off and landing? Stick off, oh, and landing. off and landing. Yeah. So this is the short period mode, folks. Uh, first table here. Here is the flying qualities for the short period mode. Look at this. It seems that it doesn't depend on the airplane class. So it, it doesn't doesn't matter, but it, it depends on the category, and also it seems that the omega n, omega n is is always satisfactory. It seems that with, whenever you have a horizontal tail, it will adjust things. So it's it's not it's not a big deal. It's just what what it seems that what worries pilots for the short period mode is the damping ratio. So they they classify. It turns out that the classification is based on the damping ratio. So um, cat A and C, this is uh, A here is the, is the military thing, missing a Y. So military thing, so we need high precision. Also cat C is, uh, we're doing takeoff and landing or landing at least, so there is high precision. So in both cat A and C, actually we need high precision. So we're gonna expect that the requirements here will be more stringent than the requirement there where we're just doing cruise um, cruise climb and descent kind of thing. You don't need to, to keep thinking about why the numbers look like what they look like, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm discussing with you now. 
but there is some logic behind it. It's always interesting to think of to think to think about it. So you can you will you will always see here that the, the requirements here are more stringent than there because simply you need more precision here. So uh, this is the short period. Let's uh, and then I'm gonna just copy for all of them. This is the long the long period mode. So these are the two modes of um, the um, the longitudinal file dynamics. And let me get the where is the the spiral? Here is the spiral. Actually, yeah, okay. This is the spiral mode, and, and this is interesting. I need to, um, so this is a spiral mode. What is given in this table is something called T2. Uh, we did not uh, talk about T2 in this course before, but you probably have seen it in 170. So what is T2? How do you characterize the, the time scale? If you have a mode and this mode is a stable, how do you characterize the, how, you, how, you, how, how can you describe, say, this is a fast or slow thing and it's stable? Well, uh, one thing is to uh, say, uh, if I have, here is the pole, maybe I get the real part, right? So uh, this is the pole location, right? So tau, the time constant, is actually one over the pole location, correct? Um, and then, as you guys know, settling time is simply four times tau, or four divided by the pole location, four divided by the real part. Any question about that? So uh, when it's unstable, so the pole is here. There is nothing called settling time. It's still actually still still the 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 tau the time constant is the same definition so it's one of a real part but there's nothing called settling time because simply the system doesn't settle anymore right so there's no meaning for the settling time it's an unstable but there's something called time to double and to double i don't know if you have heard of it in your 170 class or not probably yes this is we denoted by t2 and it's simply 0.7 times tau okay so uh, it's an unstable system. So if it's disturbed, say say it's an unstable system in the angle of attack, for example. So if you got a disturbance in the angle of attack one degree, it's gonna blow up event, right? So uh, this one degree after a while, it will double, it will become two degrees and so and so. How long would it take to double this initial disturbance? This is the time to double and you simply obtain it by 0.7 tau. Questions about that, about the time to double. All right, when I see this table and all what is provided is simply time to double, it means that pilots already agree that the spiral mode will be unstable. Fine. So actually all the levels, even their choice of level one, the best flying qualities, they give you the time to double. They are okay with the spiral mode being unstable. They just want it to be slow enough. So the time to double must be larger than this value in the table. That's it, okay? Questions? Let's get the, uh, this is the roll mode. So this is the rolling mode. It's the fastest mode, and uh, they give you the time constant, the tau, which is the one over the pole location, right? So you can see it's, it's quite fast, you know, one second, 1.4 second. So quite fast, the fastest mode, this is the rolling mode. And look at the short period, the, I'm sorry, the Dutch roll mode. And here you will realize, here you will realize how obsessed the pilots are with the Dutch roll mode. Why? Because it's very extensive table. It's of course for different classes. It's different for different classes, for different flight categories. They give you minimum zeta, minimum omega. And not only that, whereas these should have been sufficient, they also give minimum zeta times omega. 
So it seems that they're really obsessed with the Dutch role mode. Uh, we need to adjust it, okay? So these are the five tables. And let's have a quick example. So this is a fighter airplane. Now we, we used to just ignore this, uh, the story behind the problem. Now we cannot anymore because this means, means something for us. Fighter airplane for us means that it's class four. So it will help me when I go to the table, okay? So fighter airplane, at sea level, probably is doing something uh, related to takeoff and landing, terminal phase. So this now means something, fighter. This now means something. It should have been more clear than just sea level. It has the following characteristics. So uh, you note, I guess it's 200 feet per second, and it gives you some other characteristics. Let me let me copy the characteristics characteristics here. Uh, yes, it gives you um, Z alpha negative 952. Uh, M alpha is negative 2.06 and uh, mq negative 0.6 and it's asking you uh, about the flying qualities is Again, it mq sorry is mq negative yeah thank you so much yes it has must be negative so um, what I'm trying to say. Okay, it asks you about the flying qualities. Determine the flying qualities. What is the flying qualities? Let's do it together, please, because they're gonna be in, it is in homework eight, probably you have seen it, and it's gonna be in the final for sure, a question about the flying qualities. Okay, so let's determine the level of flying qualities for this airplane. Uh, we have five tables. What do you think, what mode they are talking about? Did they should, in the final, I would be clear with you. I would tell you, determine the flying qualities of the following mode, of mode X. What mode they are talking about? What do you think when they give you M alpha and MQ? Okay, the, I think a short period. Short period, very good. So let's get the short period. That, that's easy. This problem is really easy now because simply it's one of two ways. Either construct the A matrix of the short period. Remember the A matrix of the short period? You you should have it in your cheat sheet. So this was ZW, U naught, MW, MQ. That's it. Go and do lambda I minus A. This will be something like lambda square plus something times lambda plus something. And we always know that the free term is simply omega N squared. And this term is to zeta omega N. Get zeta and omega N and go to the table. Or simply we have expressions for omega n short period and zeta short period. Also, I encourage you to include them in your cheat sheet. That's it. So this was, I guess, negative m alpha plus, I guess, z w m q. And uh, here was negative z w and m q divided by two omega n short period. So let's get, let's just substitute. What do we have? Well, I have M alpha, it's it's here, right? I have MQ, it's here. And uh, I don't have ZW, I just have Z alpha. Again, I'm reminding you guys that W is really U naught times alpha. So anything divided by W, like ZW, is the same thing divided by alpha, divided by U naught, okay? So uh, from here, from Z alpha, I can divide by U naught, which is 200 feet per second and substitute it here. Okay, so this way, oops. Yes. Um, professor, so we knew to look at the short period mode, more or less based off of the variables we were given, right? Yes, but like I said, in the final, I, if I give a problem, it would be clear. This one is from the book. But I mean, it's easy to tell, right? M alpha and MQ, of course, it's, this is the short period mode. All right, we're gonna substitute to just get a number here. What is the number that we get? We get here something like 3.96. Indeed, we don't need anything to do with omega n of the short period mode because the table is all on, on zeta. But we needed to substitute there. So we got zeta, zeta is point, 
uh, I'm sorry, this is actually, this is one, oops, is, this is 1.53 and zeta is 0.34. Okay, so zeta is 0.34. Let's go together. It's a fighter airplane, sea level. Here is the short period mode. Let, let me actually get it again. Let me get it again here. This is the short period mode, right? Okay, let's see. This is a fighter airplane, so it's a class four, but actually the short period mode doesn't care with classes. Very good. Sea level, we assume that it's terminal flight phase. Terminal flight phase, so take off and landing, it's cat C. So cat C, we are here in this column. In this column, I have my zeta is 0.34. So it belongs to what range in this column? What do you think? The level two. Level two. Anybody doesn't see this? It doesn't belong to level one, obviously. Right? So uh, because it doesn't lie within the range, it's less than the minimum and it lies within this range. So indeed, it's level two flying qualities. Okay, any questions? So this is the type you see, it's, it's really straightforward, but, but there, is, there are lots of underlying physics to get there. So questions? How did you know it was in category C? This is assumed again in a in a in a problem. If I give it, it would be clearer. This assumed why because he said it's sea level, so I would assume that it's it's doing uh, takeoff or landing, it's terminal 